everyone. Um, I've just met um, some people in the breakout room for service accommodation, so I just want to say thank you for that. It was really helpful. Um, so my name's Steph. Thank you for having me. I'm really quite excited to be here. And today what we're going to do is we're going to look at how we can use the Belbin team roles within our business. You might want to get a pen, paper, make some notes. It's entirely up to you. Um, you what you'll see there on the screen is my QR code. Um, so if you want to connect, um, if you just scan that, it'll take, take you to my link tree. And on my link tree, you'll see just sort of like my socials and my contacts and things like that. If anyone wants to connect after this or give me a little follow, that'd be amazing. Um, so what we're going to do today, if you've not heard of Belbin, I am actually going to go through it. So please don't worry and think, oh, I have no idea what it is. I am going to go through it um, and make sure that we all know what it is and how we can utilize it within our businesses. Whether we are a one man band, whether we are in couples, whether we are in teams or we JV with people, hopefully there will be something that you can take away from this today that will help you in your business. Um, this is all as well, you'll just see a couple of logos there. This is all fully accredited certified content as well. Um, I am an accredited Belbin practitioner and um, all of my content and my coaching programs as a leadership coach are fully accredited by the Institute of Leadership and Management as well. So hopefully, as I say, you'll learn something, get something really good out of this today. Just a little bit of a background um, information about me. Um, if that changes so as to say I'm a certified leadership coach Belvin practitioner I'm actually um, a high school teacher as well I teach ages 11 to 18 so all the way up to six form I teach English literature and language um, I'm actually got a leadership position in the school I'm head of whole school literacy as well um, I'm now part-time thanks to property and thanks to my coaching businesses not quite ready to uh, take the plunge and quit my teaching role altogether yet but I have been in education for over 14 years now um, so again just a bit of the leadership background um, when I originally spoke to Claire about becoming uh, being a speaker on tonight's Zoom I said well there's, there's two options I said I can go down the, um, the the route where you'll need your violins out I said or I can actually do something that will um, will help people um, as I say just putting a bit of background on there of my leadership sort of experience. I won't go through it. And of course, I'm a property investor. I've got a small portfolio of Vitalets. Um, now I'm venturing into the world of serviced accommodation, um, looking at uh, city centres, Chester and Liverpool, or maybe the outskirts now, I've, I've decided. Um, I don't like you after that. And Nick after that um, breakout room, so thanks for that. Um, so if anyone wants to connect on that level as well, um, please feel free. I'll put my QR code up at the end as well. So. What I want us to think about then, first of all, before we even go into Belbin, who or what is Belbin um, and how we can utilize it. I want everyone to just start thinking about the different tasks that they have to do within their property business. So anything that from, from sort of anything creative, operational processes, have a little think. I put some on there that, that I do. So everything we do in our business, we've got the research, the ongoing CPD, the trainings, crunching the numbers, being creative with the numbers, negotiating with estate agents, with vendors and, and so on. All of that communication, delegation of tasks, which some people quite, uh, find quite difficult sometimes, anything to do with systemization, anything administrative, raising money, managing money, social media content, marketing our businesses. You could have a list longer than your arm, couldn't you really, when you think about everything you have to do within your business. And one of the things that we're gonna think about today is whether you are the right person in your business to be doing that job or to be doing that task. And you might think, oh, yeah, I'm really good at this. I'm really good at that. But actually, when you delve a little bit more, um, when you delve deeper into Belbin and you realize what role you play within your property teams, you might find that you should be doing one thing more than another. So it's about having, I don't really like this phrase because it's a bit sexist, having the right man for the job. Have you got the right man for the job or the right person for the job, we should say. So. Having a little think about that, you might want to make a list, I don't know, you might want to do it after tonight and that's absolutely fine, but having a little think and as we go through, 
and I go through what who or what Belvin is and what makes a highly effective team, you can start thinking about whether you've got the right people or whether you are the right person in your property business to be doing any of these things and whether you need to maybe outsource it, bring someone else in, maybe if you're a couple or JV partners or a small, a small group. Um, particularly, I'm just thinking of, of the panel here as well. Maybe you work together on different things. Have we got the right person in the right role? So before we move on then to Bell, who or what is Belbin, I want you to think about what a highly effective team is, okay? A highly effective team, first of all, they know why they exist, okay? Again, you could be a team, you could be, you could be one person in your property group, you could be a team of two, three, four, it doesn't matter. It's not enough, I don't think, in a, in a team to say, I buy houses, Saying I buy houses or I buy property, that doesn't tell you why you exist as an, as an investor. You need to have a mission, a purpose, something that is relevant, something that is clear. Um, it might be, in this case, the purpose is, you know, we come together um, to support, to learn, to thrive and grow. A team knows its purpose. It has a clear goal, clear vision. It knows why it exists. A team has healthy conflict as well. Conflict is often seen as quite a negative in um, any sort of uh, business and it really really isn't conflict is not negative if it is healthy conflict and it's generated through trust um, in his book five dysfunctions of a team Patrick Lencioni said teamwork is amazing but is so incredibly rare um, unfortunately and you need trust at the foundation to be able to have healthy conflict within your business which is essential for transformation and then have put their trust again, trust, trust, and trust again. Trust in a business team, it needs to be a safe space. It needs to be a respectful space for people to air any issues, air what they don't agree with or, or what they think would be, could be improved without the fear of aggressive conflict later on. This is a brief overview, by the way. I do a, like a whole nine week course on this sort of stuff. So I am giving you a crash course. Um, so there will be some gaps here. Next, the leader is not the boss. The leader in the team should make space for people in their team who they know may know more on one subject than another. Whoever the leader is in the team needs to facilitate the growth of that team. At the end of the day, I do in my job, I do what I can for the students I teach. So therefore I need to ensure that as the leader, I can facilitate maximization of the potential of the team of teachers, if that makes sense. And then lastly, what makes a highly effective team? Well, of course, as a Belbin practitioner, um, I'm gonna, I would always advocate using Belbin and his team roles to maximize strengths and skills. So who or what is Belbin? This is one of my favorite people in the whole world. Um, I think he's about 93 now, 92, 93. Um, he's cracking on and he's still doing amazing um, and I absolutely love him. So this is Dr. Meredith Belbin and in the 1960s he conducted a, I think it was like a nine year study, eight nine year study at Henley Business College and he was trying to find and, and study ways in which people help uh, people work together and when people work in these effective combinations they achieve so much more than when they're working alone. So he did this study about how people work together and how they contribute together as a team. And what he found was the best performing teams were not the ones that was, um, were not the ones that were most qualified for the job, but actually the ones that were suitable. So to be suitable for a job, you don't necessarily need the, the qualifications to engage in that. Of course, in some some um you know professions you do, like medicine or teaching or whatever, but generally the best performing teams were the ones who were most suitable. He also found in his research, again, this was over nine years, high performance in teams is not linked to intellect. So when I started property a couple of years ago, um, I remember being on my basic training uh, sort of course with a, with a property company that, that we did some training with. Um, and I remember being on that course and, and again, just the basics, the fundamentals of your like property, running the numbers. And I remember sitting next to um, a woman who had a, a salon, a hair salon. And she was very, very nervous. She was thinking, oh God, this, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not clever enough for this. I'm not clever enough for this. 
and that at the time I was like oh my god no like don't you know you you'll learn you'll fight you'll be fine you'll grow you'll thrive and it's, it's interesting now she's she's financially free she's got this portfolio it's amazing a follower is still on social media it's just incredible because high performance is not linked to how clever you are it's linked to how well you can you can operate in your own team so from all of this research, and again, this is a bit of a crash course, he formed what's called these nine team roles, which I'm going to go through now. And these are nine clusters of behavior in a team. It's very different to, you can, you can do like, you can do like, oh, what's it called? The wealth dynamics and there's different personality sort of tests that you can do. I mean, maybe in, in certain things that we've, you know, we've done before as, um, as property investors, we've learned about the monkeys, the dolphins, the, the lions and, and the, I don't know, the owls, the, the, the people who are analytic. But this is not like that. This is not a personality test. This is this is basically going through team roles that tell you how you can be how you behave in a team and the way that you find out who you are is you have to do a Belbin team role report but I'm going to go through that at the end so I'm going to have a little um go through of these nine roles now and I want you to start thinking about right who am I what strengths do I have what attributes do I have which of these nine roles will I fit into and a team role just so we're clear is a tendency to behave, contribute. That's, sorry, oh my God, I'm an English teacher and I've got a spelling mistake there. How bad is that? Yeah, never mind. That's why I'm part time, just sacking me. Uh, to behave, contribute, and to relate with others in a particular way. There's a, a friend of mine in here actually, and she's not going to let me live that down. I know that. I just, you never get away with it as an English teacher, unfortunately. But anyway, so a team role is a tendency to can behave and contribute and interrelate with others in a particular way. And the key word there is tendency. A tendency means your behavior is not fixed, okay? Your behavior is something, it's not like personality, which is generally fixed from childhood into adulthood. By adulthood, you've more or less developed your personality. Your behavior is something you can change and it can change and develop over time, whereas personality is quite consistent. So with you in your team roles, you can have two or three strong roles out of the nine one will be really really strong but then the other two or three that are your other strong ones you can adapt and you can change you can do what's called style flexing um i could talk about emotional intelligence there and enable to enable you to do that but that is a whole other um zoom unfortunately so before we move on just a little reflection for you before we move on to uh, the Belbin team roles. I want you to think about if you were to describe or just even brainstorm, I don't know if you want to take a picture of that or, or what, I'm not sure. If you were to describe your current team now, how would you describe it? How do they work? Are they effective? Okay, are the people in your team effective again? It might just be you working with members of your power team. It might, you might be a couple, which I know is quite popular anyway. You know, a lot of people go into business as couples. Are you effective? How do you know? How could you improve? What could you improve? How could your team be more effective at different tasks or projects? And again, asking, have I got the right person for the right role here? Have I got the right person doing the right task? What roles do people play within your team? You know, how imbalanced are you? Because just going to this quote here, what Belbin said is what's needed for a good team is not well-balanced people, but people who balance well with each other. And it's thinking about as well, are you comfortable with the roles that you're doing? There's a huge sort of hype I find sometimes in property uh, and, and different circles. Move outside your comfort zone, get outside your comfort zone. This is where success, success happens. And that's great. And I agree with that to an extent. But I also think it's very overrated. Because if you are the most effective and efficient at that particular task in that particular comfort zone, why would you not stay in there and just maximize it? And then anything you're not necessarily comfortable with or not necessarily efficient at, arguably, you could outsource it to somebody else. Um, I'll talk about myself and my partner in a moment about our um sort of property roles but basically I was trying to push my part of Phil way outside of his comfort zone um, in terms of social media he's not someone who posts on social media he hates coming up with content he hates being behind the camera I made him do a walkthrough of a property refurb that we did once while I was filming him I was like the dictator and he was just 
terrified and of getting it wrong and it, it just wasn't comfortable there so why would I try to put the create like I'm I'm the one who could create the content he's the one who's quite happy being the team worker and being the negotiator and being the communicator with with people face to face why would I make him do that when he's a he's uncomfortable doing it b he's never going to get comfortable doing it and c he's not very good at it bless him sorry <laughs> um so it's about yes staying in your comfort zones uh, sorry going outside your comfort zones to a point but actually are you more comfortable within it are you going to maximize yourself within it so i'll tell you a little bit about the team roles now so again if you want to get pen and paper and um, that's absolutely fine because i think as i go through you might start to see um potentially some familiarities you might think oh actually this is me or this isn't me as we go through so this is all about putting together a well-balanced team okay this is a, a well-balanced team so when the team first starts off on a project or um starts getting together maybe you're jving maybe you're at the start of your business i don't know but at the beginning okay you go around in circles there's a lack of direction no clear goals uh, you know, the, the team may have a leader and everyone might have their delegated roles and responsibilities, but that does not necessarily mean the team will be effective. So the person you need at the beginning of any project is a plant. So to get things going, we need people who are the plants, okay? The plants are the people who are creative, they're imaginative, they are free thinking, they are a bit unorthodox, they think outside the box. The plants are the people who come up with these ideas because these are the people who color outside the lines. In fact, they might not even see the lines to begin with, which like for me, that stresses me out a little bit actually. Um, I, I like the lines and I like rules and I like order. These plants are brilliant because the people who are the plants, they generate ideas that solve problems they are problem solvers. Sometimes you'll have plants who might be quite introverted people. They tend to operate at a distance from others. Plants as well, as with every team role, you have weaknesses. So you'll have your strengths, okay? So if you're sat, sat there thinking now, I'm definitely a plant. I've definitely got a few leaves on my head here. Brilliant, okay? But <laughs> some, <laughs> sorry, see some of you laughing there. My jokes are terrible, by the way. So if you're just gonna laugh out of pity, that yeah, please spare me. <laughs> um, yeah, you might be sat there, you might be thinking, yes, I'm definitely a plant or, or I'm not, I don't know. But every team role has a weakness, okay? So we're identifying our strengths, but also weaknesses and allowable weaknesses. Plants sometimes, because they're the ones who generate the ideas, they're the ones who often react quite strongly to criticism. They can't always communicate effectively. Sometimes they might be quite preoccupied, lack practical restraint, they're quite radical, but they have a great function with any business. Okay, they generate new proposals, they solve complex, complex problems, they're great in the initial stages of any project, or when a project is failing, okay, they're great for that. Plants usually make their marks as founders of companies, actually, um, inventors, originators of new products, uh, CEOs, that sort of thing. Um, so if you sat there thinking, I'm a plant, then great, we need you at the beginning of the project. But too many of these ideas might be a little bit unsound. Plants, whilst great are coming up with ideas, they don't often evaluate their own ideas, own ideas well enough. They are suited to somewhere with less structure and less of a hierarchy. As I say, they color outside the lines, but they may not have seen the lines in the first place. So what we have to do then is we have to bring in what's called our ME, our monitor evaluators. These are the people in your teams who are sober, strategic, discerning. They weigh up all the options and they judge them accurately. Solicitors, if you think of our power teams, the solicitors are the ones who are the monitor evaluators. The accountants are the evaluators, uh, sorry, monitor evaluators. But you, you might be sat there thinking, yes, yeah, definitely me. Get analysis paralysis over those spreadsheets. These people are highly critical. They've got high critical thinking ability. They are quite slow in decision making sometimes. They love the data. They love the detail. They're quite, um, they prefer to think things over quite a lot. 
best to get it right than to rush it and get it wrong. As I say, analysis paralysis, they can have a lot of friction with the plants because the plants are like, let's do this, let's do that. This is amazing. I've got this idea, I've got that idea. But the monitor evaluator is like, mm, actually, let's weigh every single thing up step by step before we move on. They're very seldom wrong though. They are very seldom wrong because they take so long to come up with these decisions. Uh, they are somebody that in your business you should consult when difficult decisions have to be made. In your business, their function, they're best suited to analysing and evaluating deals, uh, weighing up the pros and cons maybe. And again, I'm hoping you're starting to think now about what kind of maybe I've got two people already. Um, I've got a plot, sorry, two roles already, plant, monitor, evaluator, who have I got in my team? Unfortunately, these people are a little bit dry, um, sometimes overly criti critical. That's one of their allowable weaknesses, but these people thrive in high level roles. So then we move on to too much intellect starts arguments. So if you remember what I said before, Belvin says what's needed is not well balanced individuals, but people who balance well with each other. So we bring in someone whose ability causes others to work towards a shared goal. These are our coordinators. So this role of the coordinator, these people are mature, they're trusting, they're confident, and they delegate very readily. They've got interpersonal relationships with people, which means they're quite easy at spotting talent in other people. And they use these talents in other people in pursuit of the group objectives. They're not always the smartest, but they do have a rather broad and worldly outlook. These are the people in your teams that see the end goals. Some of the weaknesses though for coordinators, they often can take credit for the effort of the team. They might offload the work onto other people and take credit for that, but their function is that they're well placed in charge of a team that has a diverse set of skills. Coordinators do tend to deal with people who are um, you know, sort of with colleagues of, of equal rank and um, they tackle problems quite calmly but they do clash with shapers uh, because they have quite contrasting management styles and I'm going to come on to shapers shortly well actually in a second but is shit getting done basically is the team getting shit done excuse the language but there's no only one way to put that so when the team isn't getting anywhere, there's lots of decisions. We need someone who doesn't procrastinate, who basically gets shit done. And these are your implementers. I'm an implementer. I score quite highly as an implementer on my report. These are the people who are very type A, uh, efficient, organized, practical, reliable. They love systems and they love processes. They like, they're really good at working with the plants because they can turn plants into, um, they can execute the ideas. So, for example, uh, one of my my um, property mentor, she's very much a plant and she's like, everything's an idea. We could do this. We could do that. And then I might write how let's put a system in place to do that and actually get a plan together. Gantt chart, whatever. I love a good Gantt. Um, and put something in place where we can actually execute this plan. So turning ideas into practical action. These people do contrast with the uh, plants because we color inside the lines, we don't break those rules, we like rules, we like regulation, which does make us, I say us, I'm talking this, yeah, I am an implementer, it does make us slightly inflexible, it does make us lack spontaneity, we're quite rigid, but these people who are in, the, in your teams, these have a really good sense of control and discipline, and they favor hard work and tackle problems systematically, and they're less concerned with self-interest, but more how the business or the company can thrive, and the function in your business of an implementer, they're useful because of their reliability and capacity for application. They succeed because they're efficient and they have a sense of what's feasible and what's relevant and they do what needs to be done. They're competent in tackling any necessary tasks. But then how do we know things are being done to a high enough standard? Then we have what we call the completed finishers. These are the people in your teams, and I've met a lot of completer finishers in property um, and in teaching, actually. These are the most conscientious people that you will ever have in your workforce, um, the completer finishers. These are the people who like the finer details, and they go through everything in pay, with painstaking agony. They're anxious, but they're motivated by this internal anxiety. 
nothing is ever perfect though, despite polishing and perfecting. Um, so, and as an example, my highest role is implementer. That's my strongest team role. Um, and my other two are shaper, which I'm going to go on to in a second, and complete a finisher. I find it very hard to move on from things because I'm not happy with it. Even after this Zoom tonight, I'll be like, oh, God, I should have done this. I should have said that. It wasn't perfect. Well, we know because I've got a spelling error, obviously. Um, but yeah, I that will that will probably keep me awake. Um, but it's attention to close detail. They have a, a high degree of accuracy. The devil is in the detail and the quality control. A completer finishes unlikely to start something that they can't finish. They're not keen on delegation. They prefer to do things themselves. They're scared to outsource, basically, in case somebody else gets it wrong. Completer finishes as well. They find it quite hard to meet deadlines because, again, there's this sort of behavior, obsessional behavior with perfection. But in your a function of this type of role, and again, you could play, you could display three or four really strong roles within one person. The function, if you are a completed finisher, is that you are invaluable where tasks demand really close attention and high degrees of accuracy and high standards and, and that concern, concern for precision. But we have to explore other alternatives. Are alternative idea opportunities being explored? Now, I bet that the majority of people in here will probably have a high level of resource investigator into in them so a resource investigator these are the people that find out what everybody else is doing these are your serial networkers <laughs> so if you get people popping up at the same networking events all the time and you, you know you're on different sort of zooms or networking events i guarantee these are your resource investigators these people are enthusiastic quick off the mark extra extroverts great communicators both inside and outside of their business these people are great for um, negotiation as well so you think about where you need to negotiate in your business they explore new creative opportunities they're not a great source of original ideas so again you do need your plants at the beginning of that project but what resource investigators are really good at is taking other people's ideas and developing them and I wouldn't say stealing, I'd probably say using them as inspiration. They're skilled at finding out what's available and what can be done. And these people, these resource investigators, they always receive warm receptions because they're so outgoing and they're so communicative. But some of their weaknesses, after the initial enthusiasm dies down, they lose interest. That's, that's one of their weaknesses. Uh, they can let people down they can neglect to follow up they might over promise they might talk too much but the function in the business they're good at exploring um I, again ideas development or resources outside of their own teams and these are the best people to set up sort of um external contacts or communications with external contacts they've got the ability to sort of think on their feet probe information out of others and again you see these people at networking events. I love a resource investigator. Just in my head, I'm like, wow, you're amazing. You know, you're enthusiastic, you're opportunistic. Um, but it's interesting how, I mean, you might see yourself as a resource investigator, but someone else might not. Okay, but what happens when that initial enthusiasm sort of dies? The team can, can lose direction. Um, and then you're going to basically need to bring somebody in. And these are the shapers. So this is my second highest um team role these guys actually look a little cross and she looks like she's holding a knife I'm pretty sure it's not a knife I don't think shapers are that aggressive I think it's just the weird illustration I'm pretty sure it's a pencil but hey you never know um or shapers can get a bit aggressive shapers highly motivated people they have lots of nervous energy they've got this great need for achievement they're quite ex aggressive extroverts they have strong drives these people are the competitive ones they're concerned with winning that win 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 okay that that's all they're concerned with they keep things moving in a team though and they they like to push people forward and lead other people um and these are the people again who bring the energy into the team so you might be sat there thinking or my partner's a shaper or i'm a shaper or actually between the two of us or three of us or however many actually i don't even have any shapers in my orbit that'd be interesting to have a look at your team role reports to see how if you're in a property couple 
Um, for example, it'd be interesting to see what your team roles are and how how you can have a good balance if you both score low in the same sort of role. But as I say, these people thrive on pressure. They have sort of strong emotional responses um, to people. They lack, though, they do lack sort of interpersonal understanding and they can often offend people. But these people make good managers because they generate action and they spark life um, into things where things are slowing down. They rise above the problems, they forge ahead. They basically impose a shape or pattern on group discussions or activities. These are the most effective members of your team in terms of guaranteeing positive action. And again, it's not necessarily just about being a, being, you know, being a massive team. You don't have to, even though there are 19 roles, you don't have to have nine people in a team. Phil and I are a property team. Myself and, and Phil, we, we sort of have accountability with another um, two investors, another couple. We're a team of four when we're looking at um, doing JVs and business together. So it doesn't have to be a team of nine. You can have a couple of roles within one person. And as I say, these shapers, these are the people who will guarantee positive action 100%. But unfortunately, they piss people off. They can irritate people. Um, they're like Marmite, unfortunately. They can offend people and make no apologies. Sometimes they lose their sense of humor, can't recover with, you know, with an apology or whatever. Um, so we need somebody who's going to be a bit more supportive and diplomatic. And that's when we have our lovely little team workers. So um, the team workers, uh, this sounds awful, but in them, um, if anyone's in education or has you know friends or family who are teachers, um, there's, there's I wouldn't say like conflict at all. Like teachers do an amazing job. High school, obviously, I'm going to advocate that because that's what I do. But also primary teachers do like an amazing job. But there's there's often like a little bit of conflict, and and people say, oh, primary teachers have got it easy. These are the team workers. These are the people who are who are just quite caring for people. I couldn't be a primary school teacher. So if you think about a really caring, nurturing primary school teacher, which generally they all are. I sound like a wild west teacher, but I'm not. Um, but that this is how I would I would also view a team worker. They're supportive, super diplomatic, really good listeners, avert the friction. They don't want anyone fighting. Everyone needs to be friends. Uh, they're very mild, very sociable, very um, adaptable to different people in different situations. These team workers are. They're very very good listeners as well. These people will go to great lengths to avoid conflict or friction. So you think about this in your property business. At what point, if, if you are in, you know, think about what conflict or friction you would have and in what capacity, maybe it's argue, arguing, maybe it's negotiating with an estate agent or, or for example, which is what we I do a lot of not particularly a massive fan of them sometimes but maybe that's me as a shaper my weaknesses I need to accept it more um but think about what what you would go to great lengths to avoid okay what, what friction would you avoid in your property business and if that's what you find yourself doing then you are probably a team worker and team workers again we've got these massive massive strengths but we've also got these sort of allowable weaknesses these are very popular members of any team, but they don't like to make decisions when it comes to sort of those crunch moments, but they can prevent sort of problems arising, any interpersonal problems arising with the team. They make good senior managers because they allow everyone to contribute effectively. They manage sort of bottom up, top down conflict very, very well. They're good buffers and morale is always better when a team worker is around. But who do we send in? And this is the last team role. Who do we send in if skills are in rare supply? Well, that's when we have our specialists. And of course, we have a lot of these in, our, in property. And we've got obviously a lot of them tonight, which has been amazing. These are the people who have the skills in rare supply. They know more about less. They're very, very knowledgeable. They have a specialist focus. They have, a de they have basically dedicated area of expertise. And they take great pride in their areas and their subject and quite often can lack interest in other people's subjects um, and they become experts by sheer commitment in what I would call like a narrow focus. And this is this is fantastic because we all need this in property, don't we? Especially within our power teams. 
the function within your team is to provide again the skills that are in short supply within the team they can be called upon to make decisions based on in-depth experience but they can be quite single-minded and sort of tunnel visioned like this is this is my project this is this is what you need to do for this particular thing and that's the only way it's going to go um so that's it's an interesting one so lots and lots of specialists within property so hopefully having a look at that you've probably started to think i'm hopefully you've started to think right I'm definitely a planter. I'm definitely not a shaper. I might be an implementer or my partner is a specialist, my partner or my JV partner or whoever is a completed finisher. So hopefully I've had a bit of time there to reflect and think, right, who am I? It's quite possible to have opposites within one, uh, one person. Um, for example, as I say, I'm an implementer and a shaper. And if you just look at that, that screen there, they are more or less opposites okay they are more or less opposites these so these are divided into thinking social and action roles okay so two of my two of my strongest roles implementers and shapers they're very much action roles but then i've got sort of complete a finisher which is a thinking role so my team roles my strongest team roles are actually more or less opposites to one another which makes me a well-balanced individual my lowest team sort of role is um, plant resource investigator, coordinator, which is quite ironic because I coordinate literacy in my high school. Um, so my lower role, so I have to then think, right, well, who have I got in my team that has these skills? And it's about looking at your team role reports and thinking, right, who does what? Who should be doing what? Have I got the right man for the right job? You wouldn't put your striker in goal. You wouldn't put your front of house like behind the bar, you know, you wouldn't put your hockey player, you wouldn't give your hockey player a cricket bat, you know, have I got the right person in the right role? So before we move on, one of the things that you could do as a sort of, again, you could do it now, or you could do it later, or don't do it at all, it's entirely up to you. Like I said earlier, make a list of everything that you do within your team, within your business, within your property team, and it'd be interesting to put, and again, if you're a one-man band, that's absolutely fine, put initials next to who does what or if you're a one-man band you're one person property put maybe a tick next to the thing that you are most confident in doing or most adept at doing most comfortable doing because remember comfort zones are all good and well and um, pushing yourself outside your comfort zone doesn't always mean you're going to be successful and i said here if you think you're a plant the ideas person you shouldn't be responsible for the systems and processes if you think you're a resource um, investigator, your serial networker, you should be doing the negotiation. If you think you are a coordinator, why aren't you the one delegating? This is all, by the way, I will say, based on your self-perceptions, okay? So this is self-perception, and quite often, self-perception is quite flawed. So unless you've got a really high level of emotional intelligence, self-awareness, self-reflection, and you practice that, that's you know part of a lifelong sort of practice. It's quite difficult to think about the way you see yourself. It might be different to how others see you. So one of the things that you can do is just ignore the bottom part now, is you can get what's called a, a Belbin team role report, okay? A Belbin team role report. And what this is, you just see that there, it's a 12 page report that you will get and it's about you, your strengths, your weaknesses, your allowable weaknesses, what sort of roles you should be doing, should what you should be delegating, where your strengths lie, how you can utilize those strengths. And what you do is you have to do it, on, you do it online, you can do it through me if you want to, you do it online, you fill in a lot of questions about yourself, self-perception questions about yourself, but then what you also have is observer, observer um, people, can't speak observe a report where that is four people at least four people who also get this link and they answer questions about you as well so to put that into perspective again i've been in educational leadership for over well education 14 years now leadership for about 10 i was thinking yeah oh i'm definitely a team worker oh, i'm definitely a coordinator well, according to my team, I'm not. <laughs> so the way I see myself is always different. And I was I was a little bit human, I won't lie. I was like, no, I'm definitely this, I'm definitely that. Apparently I'm not. So I need to obviously work on my self-reflection. Self I'm, I'm 
you know, don't mind saying that. So you'll have observers fill out questions about you as well. And that's what creates the report. Because just by sitting here tonight and saying, oh, I think I'm this, I think I'm that, or I think my partner's this, I'm a JV partner's that, that's fine. But self-perception is totally biased. It's totally, totally biased. Again, if you've got the right person doing the right task, that leads to a high performing team, a highly effective team. And only by knowing, in, in my opinion, of course, I'm a Bellman practitioner, I will always advocate Bellman as, as a, a research back theory to use within your business. I'm going to advocate it. But by using the Bellman team role reports, you can actually start to think, right, how can I make my practices more effective, more efficient? How can I become more high performing at a role that is more suited to me? And it can help you with that decision making in your team naturally unquestionably maximize your performance increase the engagement save your time as well because time is something we're never going to get back so and it can help you establish direction so i did ask clara said am i okay to just sort of do my little plug no massive upsells nothing like that because that's not me not into that at all if you do want to get a Belbin team role report, I will be completely honest, you can get that direct through the Belbin website itself, and I will not make any money on that whatsoever. So that is entirely up to you, and that's your discretion. They are, I think, 40 something pound plus fat, which is 50 pound 40 in total. What I would do if you were to do a team role report with me, which I'm, I'm, I've done quite a few for investors at the moment, so you get this 12 page report, your own perceptions, of your own sort of contributions and also your observer contributions as well, how they see you. Remember, self-perception's flawed. So we need other people to comment on our behavior and attributes so that we, can, we know how other people see us and how we can behave. So you get this. So we look in on the coaching um, session. It's one session. It'll probably be about two hours long, the way that I go on, sorry. Um, but it's, a bit, it's probably about an hour and a half, two hours. We look further into the team roles, not just the opposites, but how different clusters can work together. We look at the thinking roles, the action roles, the social roles, and how you can develop them even further. We have a short overview of developing emotional intelligence, self-reflection, self-awareness, and look at Daniel Goldman's theories on that as well. It'll, we will give you actions to move forward within your business based on that 12 page report. So I'll basically coach you through it um, and a deeper understanding of how others view your behavior. It's interesting. I've had a couple of Belbin team role reports. My teaching team, so the team that I lead within teaching, they see me quite differently to how um, my property, like property partners that I've got, you know, different business partners and different aspects they see me differently to my teaching team. So it actually can tell you how other people view your behavior. And remember, it's a behavior. A team role is a tendency to behave in a certain way. Um, and of course, identify weaknesses so that we can minimize those weaknesses so that your team can thrive. But it's about recognition and acknowledgement of those weaknesses as well in order to mitigate them. Um, and obviously, Working in team is about making that contribution. If you've got a solid contribution on how you, you know, based on how you behave, how others see you behave, you know, you're increasing the massive engagement and naturally you're going to thrive. So I do sort of group intakes of these coaching sessions. So I couldn't say, oh yeah, let's let's do a Belbin team role report. We'll get on a Zoom tomorrow. It doesn't quite work like that because what you have to do is you have to have time to fill in. It's all online. I can send the links, We'd, I'd show you the process and everything if anyone's interested. I go through the process with you, you do your little self-perception online, you then email it to four other people, I can send them reminders, a minimum of four, a maximum of, of six, I can remind them through my sort of systems processes. And then when we've got all of that together, I do small group Zooms, no more than six people at a time, um, and it's 99 quid. So it's just probably, probably spend more than that on a night well. I do spend more than that on uh, me gin in a month. So, um, yeah, so if anyone's interested, again, I, I really love I really love meeting everybody. So if I don't manage to catch up with you, if you don't want a Belbin team role report and coaching session, please
please do um, connect with me on social media. Uh, please do scan that QR code because I spent 50 quid on it for my business card. So I'm like trying to get the most out of it that I can. I got a free trial for 14 days and I was handing out my business cards like there was no tomorrow. Like they were going out of fashion. Then I got an email saying people can't access your QR codes, your trials run out. I was like, what? I've got to pay now. So I thought I'm going to use it every opportunity I can just because I've paid for it. So please do scan it. <laughs> um, so it'll tell me how many people have scanned it. And if you found anything interesting or um, even if you just you don't want to do a, a team report or coaching session, that's absolutely fine. But please do. Um, I am trying to build my leadership coaching business. So I'd really appreciate if you've got anything useful out of it. Um, please do tag me on social media. So it's just at Stephanie Beatty Leadership or Facebook me or again, all of my socials are there. Thank you. So that's 46 minutes. Claire, I think you said I had 45. So amazing. Thank you. I've, just, I've got a timer here. So all good. There is a question from, um, from Tina, I think it was. Um, how does this compare with wealth dynamics? So wealth dynamics is a little bit different because that will look at your personality, we're in it, for, as far as I know. So that's looking at personal. I've not done a wealth dynamics. I only know about it. So wealth dynamics, if I'm not mistaken, is personality, is it not? I think that's I think my... Darren's opinion. done one. Darren, do you know? We, we used it for team building in a company that I used to work in in the healthcare sector. We were doing acquisitions and mergers. And we were gauging how our team was made up and um, who we were lacking, very similar to the way that you've just yeah. been talking about, Stephanie, and it was lords or other types of things. I'm a, I'm a lord in wealth dynamics, but I've never heard of the one that you've just talked about. And I was just curious um, what, the, what the differences were, how it assessed you, and if maybe the usage of both of them could be used in the business to help. They probably could, to be fair. I've heard really good things about wealth dynamics, but especially when I was speaking to um, Debbie a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, sorry, a couple of months ago, it was a uh, friend of mine had, a, um, had the wealth dynamics done. Um, and when she was going through it, I was like, well, that's, that's all good and well. But from what I my understanding of was, it was, it was very much personality based um, and how people with different personalities can work together in the team. Whereas Belbin is literally team role. It's, it's not necessarily the behavior that you would display because of your personality. It's the behavior that you would display because of the part that you put the part, the team role that you have, or, you know, your strongest or weakest team role and how you contribute to that team based on that behavior. So, I mean, for example, this is, I'll, I feel a bit silly, but I am going to share this anyway. Um, I am probably one of the most emotional people you could ever meet. Like I just see, you know, I'll see an advert for the RSPCA and I'll start crying. I'll put my slippers on the wrong feet and I'll start crying, right? But my team role, and that's probably my personality. I think I'm a bit of an empath, but one of my strongest team roles is shaper. The person who gets shit done, they drive people, they ruffle feathers. I probably in teaching piss people off a bit because I've got this energy and not everyone does first thing on a Monday morning. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's but that's my behavior within a team. So it's completely separate to my personality. I would be interested in looking at wealth dynamics, um, but as a Belvin practitioner, <laughs> I'm gonna plug Belvin all day. But Belvin's actually mm -hmm. worldwide. Um, so Belvin, as I say, it's been used uh, just out just out of interest. I don't know if you can do if I just stop sharing like a show of. Can you put hands up here? I'm not sure. Reactions. Has anyone actually ever heard of Belbin? One, two, two. Yes, I four, have. Four. Yeah, it says four parties, five, six, yeah, seven. Oh, that's good. So it's not completely unfamiliar. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, six to seven people. Have yeah, I, yeah, we used to use, yeah, we used to use Bel Belbin in um, several of the NHS trusts that yeah. I worked with. Um, and uh, also Lancashire Police Authority used to use um, Belbin for all of their senior level um, appointments. Yeah. So, yeah. Very, I've, I've come across it more working in, obviously, um, this is the public sector, isn't it? Um, my cousin, she's uh, 
ward manager in the Royal and Liverpool. She's used it before. And I find what the more I talk to people about it, the more they say, oh, I've heard of that before. And they generally have public sector jobs. And um, it's massive in educational leadership as well. But I just thought the, the one thing that I found just getting into property, getting into property, starting a property business, I suppose we should say, is that there's a lot of training out there with, uh, yeah, Christie Civil Service, yeah, it's, it's a lot of that sort of public sector. What I found was there was a lot of co a lot of coaching, a lot of training in um, sort of the managerial, probably class, sort of the stuff that you, you do in the high creation, sort of the operations, the processes, or property education in itself and content. But there's not what I found with the people, and I've, I've got a couple of coaching clients now who said that, you know, it's really useful. There's very little sort of, unless I'm just walking around with blinkers on, I hope not. There's very little um, out there in regards to um, leadership within property. And that's where Belbin falls in, like sort of being a leader in a team or working within a team. It comes under the sort of remit of leadership, which is why I include it in my um, my leadership coaching as well. But yeah, it's it, and Belbin, have a little look at the Belbin website. As I say, you don't have to get a Belbin report through me. I make no money on them. Um, but obviously do a coaching session with me by all means. But, you know, have a little look on the Belbin website, go on the social media. Um, and it's literally, it's used worldwide. So I was on a Zoom on Wednesday afternoon um, at this Belbin Africa, Belbin North America, Belbin Europe. That it's, it's, it's very, very much worldwide. Um, so ha do have a little Google of it. I'll say maybe tag me in it as well. <laughs> giving them all the business and giving it give it away myself but um yeah have a little look it's so so useful I know a lot of people have come across it before but one thing I will say is that if you ever do come across it um if they're not a Belbin accredited practitioner it is copyright but I have to say that because mm. I am accredited so just it's interesting and it, a lot of people can talk about the theory but if they sort of have you start analyzing your own team roles without being accredited I know that they have sued quite a lot of people so um just be mindful of that <laughs> so I, yeah. had, I had to do one for um a job interview oh really yeah what was just what you, just it was um to be a mortgage broker for yeah. a firm um I've gone self-employed now um but yeah no they did um did it to find out if I'd fit in their team or not did and that I came up there, with yeah. the the plant so the one with all the ideas and stuff. ideas that's the thing so it's I, I I really would advocate I wouldn't make it be the be all and the end all of um, hiring somebody or not, but I would definitely advocate having that done if you're thinking about bringing somebody into your business, because as I say, when, when Belvin did the study in Henley Business College, it wasn't necessarily about um, the most qualified people, it was whether they're the most suitable, um, can, what can they bring? So when I, um, I sort of do like team workshops and we get all of the team roles up on, on a sort of flip chart, if you like, on a big board, and they've got their team, they do team reports. So you're talking, you know, teams of 10, teams of 50, whatever. And we sort of, we note on the, on the sort of the wheel that I showed you before with all the different team roles, we put our initials next to the strongest team roles so that the initials of the people in the team. And then we sort of start to see what roles we're lacking in then. And that's how you know, right, well, I need to some, I need to look at their second strongest team role. Can that person do this particular job because their second team, um, strongest team role was specialist for example so only by doing that you can start to look at where the gaps are mm -hmm. and especially in, in larger teams maybe um teams of let's say four or more it's easy to do that you sort of map it out look at where your gaps are right well actually we've got no plants okay my strongest role isn't plants what's my second strongest role what's your second strongest role so you can have two two or three really strong roles and it's about looking at them and thinking right where are my strengths lying Again, have I got my striker and goal? And that's what's most important to think and have I got the right person and the right job to maximize efficiency within the business. Um, so yeah, I could talk about this all night to be fair. Are there <laughs> any other questions? Because I'm aware it's half nine. 